Welcome to this week's episode of Everyday Thin Places. I'm Rachel Gallagher, and I'm an interfaith hospice chaplain. And I'm Elizabeth Ferrasso, and I'm a birth doula. And in each episode of Everyday Thin Places, we draw from our experiences supporting birthing people and dying people to explore with honesty, authenticity, and humor how we can all become more truly living people. Well, I am really excited about today's episode. This is a special treat because I have known you, Elizabeth, for, gosh, probably at least 10 years, Mm -hmm. I think longer. Um, But I'm really excited to ask you questions specifically about your relationship with birth as it pertains to this podcast, but also to share with our listeners who you are as a person and the things that kind of define you, um, because I think you're super cool and I love spending time with you and I'm really excited to share you with the whole wide world on this podcast. So it is really exciting. World, meet Elizabeth Verasso, birth doula. (laughs) So I think as it relates to our podcast, one of the big questions that I have is just how did you get involved in the kind of business of birth? I think it's not not anything that ever crossed my mind. Yeah. And so how did that happen for you? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's not anything that crossed my mind either. Uh, and I, I don't think my story is super unique with this. There's a lot of people that have had the same experience. But for me, I had other things that I was doing. I had um, a background. I, I studied psychology in my undergraduate degree. I came to Philadelphia to go to the University of Pennsylvania to get my master's degree in psychological services. I stayed in Philadelphia and I um, met my husband in Philadelphia and I found myself pregnant in Philadelphia. (laughs) And so it was for me the experience of going through pregnancy, going through birth myself and the kind of care I got that all of a sudden I realized how meaningful, how important, how formative it was to go through that experience with really solid support. And so I went into birth, unfortunately, well, fortunately and unfortunately, fortunately, I had really great caregivers. I just discovered a model of care with midwifery care at a birth center. So out of a hospital, I I, uh, had a friend who had given birth at this birth center. It sounded like a good idea. It was in like a a place across the street, a home-like environment across the street from the hospital in case you needed to have medical care that they could only give you at the hospital. It was just a walk across the street. Um, and I loved everything about that care, the way that the midwives cared, the way that I remember an appointment where it wasn't just about how much weight had I gained, what was my, what was my little urine dip uh, results of what, um, it wasn't just about medical things, but I remember a midwife saying, you know, what, have you noticed a theme in your dreams? Have you noticed that you're like dreaming anything or your dreams showing you anything that you're particularly excited or worried about? So it was this really beautiful, amazing care and that carried into birth. That was all the fortunate part is that the beauty of that midwifery care. The unfortunate part was I remember someone raising their hand during a birth class that I was a part of. And they said, uh, is it a good idea to hire a doula? Literally the first time I ever heard the word. Never had heard of a doula before. So this is back, my first pregnancy would have been back in 2008. And um, never heard the word. And unfortunately, the person responded by saying, oh yeah, it's a great idea if you can afford one. Period, end of story. So no one explained what a doula was, what a doula might be able to do for me. Um, And I just sort of got the impression that maybe they were for the rich and famous. And it was not going to be something that was a part of my birth support team. And so I had really great care from my midwives. My husband was a tremendous support. Um, My mom made it into town in time to be there to help us out to be one additional person fanning me and bringing me ice and doing all the things that it took. But my husband will tell you that the first moment he had by himself where he went out to the car to get the car seat, um, he sort of had his moment to be by himself and think his thought that crossed his mind was, 
that was really hard work. I don't know if I can ever do that again. Um, and I remember a moment myself where uh, even in the tub, I got to be in a jacuzzi tub. Isn't that, I mean, isn't that how you picture like well-supported, perfect um, birth um, in the jacuzzi tub saying, I know I want to have more kids, but this is really hard work. I don't know if I can ever do this again. And um, so we both sort of felt like we were given this beautiful gift of this amazing baby girl. And, um, you know, I got to take her home. We got to keep her. Um, it was worth the effort to come, come out of it with this amazing child. But why would somebody clock in to do that? Why would somebody do this work? for a paycheck. I thought that labor and delivery nurses, obstetricians, midwives must be crazy people to just do this for their job, to be around that much intensity Mm. day in and day out. Um, And so, but I also know a lot of people have more than one kid, you know, (laughs) we're not, we're not all only children that happened by accident. Um, People choose to like do that all over again to grow their family even more. And so when we were ready to grow our family to another child a couple years later, I was like, wait, what was that doula? What was that Mm -hmm. doula thing? I need to understand more about what a doula does. Because I remember when the midwife came in, and she pushed on my back just right and made the contractions feel so much better. She did this hip squeeze, magic, witchcraft, whatever she did that like, (laughs) Just took the pain of the contraction from being overwhelmingly intense to being manageable. Um, And I knew that it was really hard work for my husband. And I wanted him to be able to enjoy the moment more Mm -hmm. without so much riding on him. And so I learned that a doula gives physical support, physical physical comfort measures, um, emotional support, and informational support. And so I, and the physical support was the part that I really wanted. And so I knew that going into my next birth, I wanted to have, um, I wanted to have that support, that continuous support. That's the other part of the doula distinctive is that a doula is there continuously. So whereas you might see different providers during the course of your pregnancy, um, you may have met the midwife or the doctor who's going to be the one that cares for you the day you show up in labor. You probably will not have met your nurses unless you somehow know all the nurses that work at a particular <laughs> place of um, birth. And so you get to have someone there who you've developed a relationship with who understands your hopes and your fears and your particular needs. And do you hate having your head touched or do you Mm -hmm. love having your head touched? Do you want people to be quiet or do you want some energetic music to push you through? Um, And so somebody that gets to know you and stays with you that whole time. And um, actually the very first studies that they did to show that there was an impact of all of the outcomes that we like to see in birth, like all of the um, satisfaction with birth, lower intervention rates, um, lower rates of postpartum depression, um, success with breastfeeding for people that are wanting to breastfeed, all of these things that we like to see work out, all work out better when a doula is present. And In that early study, though, this doula, I'm doing air quotes that you all can't see, the doula was just a person who sat in the room Hmm. and didn't leave. Sat in a chair, didn't leave. Weren't wiping anyone's sweat from their brow, was not holding their hand, did not have essential oils, was not, didn't have any magic tricks or training to say, um, you know, here's how I'm going to make it better for you, but just didn't leave. Hmm. And so that power of presence that power of being there as a witness, that power of um, just knowing you're not going to be left alone mm. is is so important. And so when I added a doula to my support team for the second time around, I, um, you know, as they say, I caught the birth bug because <laughs> I, I realized that having all of those pieces in place meant that I could thrive through the experience I would say that I endured my first birth because what was I going to do? Just like say I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. Take me home. Um, But when my son was born, I would, I thrived through that. I was, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe how well it went. I couldn't believe um, when all the people that I really needed were there to help me, how much of a difference it made. And so it's like, oh, well, maybe these people aren't crazy and maybe I would like this job too. Hmm. And so I, um, so I did a training Uh, I did the prerequisite reading. I did the training, the weekend training, and I jumped in there even the very first time that I was at a birth. Um, I remember the nurse afterwards asking me if I had a card 
<laughs> like, are you? Because <laughs> she thought I had done it before. And I was like, yeah, this is my first birth. Because there is so much of a, um, really anybody that has the basic training of some of the things that you need to know about birth but more so has just this heart, this sort of spirit about them that they want to bring that comforting presence, that confidence infusion to someone who is going through such an important life event, but maybe feels really intimidated or overwhelmed. Mm. Um, So that's what I get to do. That is why, I mean, we can arm wrestle for this title of who has the best job in the world, because I know (laughs) you feel like you have the very best job in the world. That's why I feel like this, um, this is the best job in the world. Yeah. I can, yeah, I can relate to, to that feeling of just getting to help people through something so challenging, so, you know, to be in such a privileged environment. Yeah. That sounds amazing. I have a lot of questions for you, though, because I've never given birth. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I don't even really, I mean, I think it might be helpful for me and for a lot of our listeners for you to even just break down, like, how would you explain your job as a doula to your kids? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have, I have four kids. There are those first, those first two, my, my baby that I endured, my baby who I thrived through labor. Um, I decided that, you know, I was going to become a doula. I was doing my training. That was how I was going to get my baby fixed because uh, baby number two was very colicky, which is the technical term for cries <laughs> many hours every day for weeks. Um, and so I thought, I'm going to wait longer till we have any more kids one day, but I'll get my baby fixed by becoming a doula mm. and um, <laughs> helping other people have their babies. But then... Um, if we looked at the calendar, I think I might find that I was probably as, as like, if you say a little bit pregnant, the littlest bit pregnant you can possibly be <laughs> before you're not actually showing positive on a test the weekend I went for my doula oh my training. Goodness. So that waiting and having the doula fill in for your baby fix, that was... Yeah, no, that didn't happen. Rather, <laughs> I was pregnant for the first seven births that I attended. Oh, my goodness. And so I, um, so my uh, my third child uh, was with me for my first seven births as a doula. I took some time off because then I had my own baby. There was a, there were some moments of confusion where I had a pretty big belly as a doula and <laughs> a nurse would come in and be like, I thought you were giving a urine sample. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm the doula. Um, and so then, so I had those three and then had a nice little long stretch, um, and had our fourth icing on the cake baby who is, uh, just about 23 months old. So we have a, this cluster of bigger kids and this icing on the cake baby. <laughs> we have a very fun family. Um, but my kids, it's so funny. My, so my oldest, especially because she's really articulate. I remember her at three and a half years old because I was pregnant. She was, I was only three or she was only three and I was pregnant with baby number three. And she's like, mom, do I have a uterus in me? <laughs> so we talk about things like, you know, I have a, I have a knit uterus laying around the house. I have a plush pelvis. I also I have two <laughs> pelvises. I have a plush pelvis and I have the actually bony, like uh, plastic pelvis. And so there's a lot of talk in our family about birth being a beautiful, normal life event. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we use all the technical terms. My children have been in the backseat of the car arguing about who has a penis and who has a vulva. I hope that does not create us to have to put an explicit uh, label on this <laughs> podcast. But we use all the proper terms so our kids know, um, they understand about um, birth just being a normal life event to celebrate. They understand that bodies are so smart, that bodies... Um, without us having to add any extra knowledge to the equation that bodies know how to grow babies Mm. and that they spend a lot of life like knowing mom is on call, which means that I'm waiting for someone to call me and tell them, tell me that they're in labor and I'm going to go join them and support them. And that could happen anytime within a four week period. Mm. So there's a lot of just like the excitement of there's going to be a baby coming. And I used to get home again. My oldest is the articulate very involved one. And so she would always, when I came home from a birth, she would want to know, even if she was sleepy and I was kissing her on, you know, kissing her in her bed to let her know I was home. She would say, mom, did the mama throw up? (laughs) 
what kind was it? Oh. So she really thought that like, a li- she knew that a big part of my job was like, well, yeah, people throw up during birth. And so you're there to like, catch the throw up oh. and put a cold cloth on their head and to rub their rub their hands and their arms and their legs and their back. And so um, they really, I, my kids really understand that there's, it's just sort of like, I get to be a part of this circle of love and support of this family going through an exciting, beautiful, normal life event. And I'm an extra layer of love and presence and support and, um, and comfort that can help people go through that and keep treating it as a normal life event and not have it be primarily fearful, primarily medical, primarily something that feels uh, overwhelming to them. Wow. Your kids probably know more about bodies and birth than I do. I, oh, my kids know a lot and yeah. they don't mind telling other people <laughs> what they know. So I'm sorry for anybody who my children have ever educated anyone else's children. Well, all those other kids are just that much more knowledgeable yes. for it. They yeah. should be thanking you. Yeah. <laughs> I realize there's not actually a moment in time where I had to describe the work that I do to my kids. But I did have this moment in a conversation with my oldest daughter that made me realize, oh, this is the perfect way to try to describe what doula work is to someone else. And so we are in the kitchen. I had this bag of pink Himalayan salt, and it's a Sherpa brand Himalayan salt. And so my daughter says, Mom, what, what does Sherpa mean? And I thought for a minute, how do I describe what a Sherpa is? And then it was so simple because I just said, oh, a Sherpa is like a doula, but for mountain climbing. So that is just the script that I've now flipped when I need to explain to someone what a doula is. So I don't really have to explain it to my kids. (laughs) But when I have to explain to someone new, what does a doula do? It's like, well, this is someone who just like on a mountain climb that's difficult, that you want to have someone who is familiar with the trail, that is packing the snacks, that's doing the grunt work, that's going to offer you water, that's going to make sure that your needs are met, that you're not intimidated by what's going on, so that you can enjoy the view, so that you can have it be a meaningful experience and not just something that's an overwhelming experience that's, you know, steals your joy because it's so overwhelming. I was like, well, that's that's the perfect way to describe it. A doula is like a Sherpa for births or flip it around. Like I had to tell my own child, a Sherpa is like a doula for mountain climbing. <laughs> I think that's a great analogy because I, I mean, I can imagine that there are many similarities between climbing a mountain and giving birth. And I wouldn't want to climb a mountain without a Sherpa. Yeah. And you wouldn't want somebody that you love to climb a mountain and expect you to be their Sherpa if you have never done it before. So it's a doula's role is not just for the birthing person. It's for their partner just as much so that they both get to enjoy the experience to the best that they can. Wow, that's interesting. You mentioned a few times you mentioned midwives. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between a midwife and a doula? Good question. Because a lot of people think like, oh, a doula, that's like a midwife. Um, A midwife is a clinical care provider. So a midwife provides all of the medical care for making sure that mom and baby stay safe. And so the midwife is overseeing an actual well-being of the health of mom and baby. So that midwife will do the same thing. Um, provide the same care that an obstetrician would. Mm -hmm. However, some of the ways that we think about a midwife being different from an obstetrician is that they're working from, they tend to approach things more um, watch and see. Um, They tend to approach things with a a holistic approach. They tend to, um, my experience has been that midwives are really great at thinking outside of the box and sort of they don't create an experience of care that is as medical. Uh huh. It's a more person centered approach. And so, and there are people who, because of their level of risk, it's not safe for them to give birth with a midwife or they do need the skills that are within the scope of practice for an obstetrician um, who is, they're more trained to look for the problems because sometimes we, we need to recognize the problems when they're there. Um, and so, Um, But a doula is just there. I am not responsible for anything clinical. 
I cannot give you advice about medical decisions. I can provide information. Mm -hmm. Say this is what the research tells us. Um, I can remind them of things that they have wanted to advocate for themselves about. Mm. Um, But I'm there to provide comfort, physical comfort, emotional comfort. So the job that I do is really unique, um, but it's not... It's not a substitution. A doula is not a substitute for a midwife. Um, and, you know, they midwives, doctors, nurses go through a lot of training. I Not nearly as much training was required for me. However, the big difference for a doula, and one of the big demands is that, like I said, you're on call for four weeks. Mm-hmm. And someone could go into labor at any time. And some births are quick. And some births are not quick. Mm. And so... Uh, doctor, a midwife, a nurse, their shift is over and they go home. And a doula is there, uh, is there for the for the long run. And so that is a huge benefit to the birthing person, but it is a huge investment for a doula yeah. to say, I'm going to be there for you. And of course, we work with backups. So there's times okay. where if I've been at a birth for 18 hours, like, yeah, I call a backup to come hang out so I can go take a nap and then I'll be back. Or, um, you know, if my children had to be in the emergency room. Actually, the only two births that I've ever missed were one, I was in the hospital. And another one I um, missed because the first call that I got was, it's a boy. (laughs) Because that baby came so quickly that uh, they didn't have time to call me. Wow. But otherwise, that's that's sort of the, um, that's the big demand of doula work is that um, being available Mm -hmm. and being on a, baby and a birthing person's body being on their time frame, not yeah. being on my own. So, wow. But it gets you access to like some of the most beautiful places. Yeah. I mean, I say places, beautiful times, beautiful spaces that you can ever, I still cry. I still cry at almost every birth. Like mm-hmm. I can't help it that the, the tears just come out when, uh, <laughs> when a baby is born and you see the interaction of a relieved person who's <laughs> glad to be done with labor and amazed to be meeting their baby and um whoever whatever other family or support people around it's it's I can't believe that I get to be there in such um profound beautiful amazing moments of life yeah you mentioned um missing a birth because the baby was just in a hurry yeah um what's the longest birth that you've attended to Oh, man, that's a good question. I've had some where a lot of it is like a coming and going. Um, I had a birth back when anybody who lives in Philadelphia will remember what we affectionately refer to as the Pope, Pop, Pope, Pope, Copolic. How would you even say that? Pope, Pope, Pope. Galips, Pope, Pope Cop- it was The Pope came the to Pope Philadelphia. Came. <laughs> and it, <laughs> we won't say hard words like that on our podcast anymore. But um, yeah, the Pope came and the entire city shut down. Yeah. And so, and people were freaking out. What are we going to do if we go into labor? And our hospital was within the red zone of where no traffic, no cars. Um, you have to get through security to even get there. And so thankfully, I had a baby who was kind enough to us to be born I think the Pope arrived on like Thursday and this baby came on Wednesday, but it's a, you know, this helps clear up a misconception. What does everybody think when they think of how birth starts? Let you tell me when, how how does it happen in the movies? The first thing that happens? I mean, the first thing I think of is contractions or water breaking. Is that people? Yeah. In the movies, it's always the water breaks and then you rush to the hospital. Yeah. So this was a situation where, um, Mom was a big Green Bay Packers fan. (laughs) And Sunday night football, there was an interception that happened to coincide with some intense cheering, which probably just coincidentally was also when her water broke. And so her water broke on Sunday evening. And although we think of it as being this, oh, no, it's going to happen quickly, or we have to get this baby out within 24 hours is sort of one of the myths. But that baby wasn't born until Wednesday afternoon. Wow. So from Sunday night which was phone support until Monday morning, going to the hospital and then going back home from the hospital. And all of this is walking Mm. because you can't take cars into the red zone. Oh my goodness. Of where this baby was going to be born at. 
Um, oh, no, you know what? We still could. I think we could get cars in because I drove, but they didn't have a car. That's what it was. And so wow. then by the time they left the hospital, they, of course, had to walk home because the Pope was there by the time they were walking home. With their brand with new their baby. baby. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. But what a great time to have a baby. Like, isn't that a fun story? I mean, you'll never forget what was going yeah. on. So oh that was goodness. that was a that was a lengthy. I think that might have been one of the longest. We went from basically from Sunday till late, late Wednesday wow. afternoon. That's not what I was expecting you to say. Oh. I, I thought you were going to say like, oh, six hours. Oh, or, no. I mean, I know, I know it goes longer, but that's, I mean, half a week. Yeah. A half a week yeah. when the city's shut down. That's why my husband is a saint. Yeah. Because um, there were plenty of times, there are still plenty of times where I'm leaving not just the wildest, orneriest, craziest kids <laughs> in Philadelphia with him, but one that is breastfeeding. Wow. And so we might be like meeting up at Qdoba real quick to eat something <laughs> and let me breastfeed a baby and then kiss them all goodbye and say, maybe I'll be home tonight. Maybe Good I'll luck. be home tomorrow. Oh my yeah. goodness. And you just wild. don't even know. Yeah. What an exciting way to live. Yeah, a little anxiety producing and exciting. <laughs> yes. Wow, you should have a reality show. Um, I, I thought I'd start with a podcast. <laughs> I would totally listen to your podcast. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. <laughs> wow, I feel like I just learned so much in just asking you a couple of questions. Mm-hmm. I'm so excited that we get to like dive into all of this stuff. Oh, awesome. So... It sounds like maybe there is no typical day or typical week no. for a doula. Um, if you had to describe in general, give me an idea of like when you have like how many how many people are you even doulaing for at yeah. a time? Yeah, so that's a good question, and this is where I guess I'm um, I'm having to say that. It's a huge part of my identity to talk about myself as a doula, but it's actually sort of a sliver of my workload Mm. because it is so demanding and I do have four kids. Um, It's really hard for anybody to do, even if they are um, single or don't have kids or much younger than me and don't have like achy bones and like (laughs) trouble staying up all night like I used to in college. Um, So I actually take on very few birth clients at this point because I've gotten to a place where I have the really unique, beautiful privilege of being with people for their second birth or their third birth. So I've been with them when the when older siblings were born. Mm. And now I'm getting to help welcome a new baby brother, baby sister. Uh, So Basically, every doula has a side gig or Mm. their doula work is a side gig because you can't do it full time. Right. Because some people that are really intense will do three or four births a month. Um, And so they overlap their on-call times. They have to rely on backup. We have this mantra where we say things just have a way of working out because most of the time they do, but we're all still sweating it. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can only sweat it for so long without feeling really overwhelmed. And so I've spent a lot of time sweating it of, is my family going to be okay? Am I asking too much of them? Am I going to miss this birth if that person goes into Mm -hmm. labor? I have had times where I ran the Broad Street run on Sunday and went to bed early and woke up to a 6 a.m. text that said my water broke and went to that birth and got home at midnight and woke up to a 4 a.m. text (sighs) that said, I'm in labor. Um, And so... Those times have made me really realize that I have to have other ways to be involved in supporting people to be prepared for birth and to just have a the best experience possible, the healthiest birth possible, the most confident birth possible with means other than me being the one physically with them. Mm. So I'm also a birth educator, which means that I teach classes all the way from early pregnancy through, um, so thinking about how to manage pregnancy and create good expectations for your birth, be equipped with the questions and the information that are going to help you to get the best care hmm. all the way through your pregnancy. And as you plan for birth, um, childbirth classes where we learn like 411 means contractions that are four minutes apart, lasting one minute for a full hour. And that's what we call active labor. And that's when you can consider going to the hospital or your other place of birth. Um, and that's when I get to pull out that knit uterus and my 
plastic pelvis and all those things. Um, and then in the postpartum breastfeeding, newborn care. Wow. Um, so I spend a lot of time just corresponding with people, people who have questions, people who have been in my class. Um, so actually teaching, I teach, you know, one of the classes of my series every, every month. Um, getting cool emails from people that have, you know, had their babies and are letting me know and and enjoying people's birth stories. And so one of the things I guess I get to plug a side gig that I do is when I realized that I could not um, say yes to all the different people that were reaching out to me about being their doula, I wanted to help other doulas get connected with them, Mm. help them be successful, get to know cool people because doulas are some of the coolest people. Um, and so I started doing video interviews and, uh, I don't know if people will be hearing our episodes in the order of realizing how much we are both devoted with all our hearts to Philadelphia, (laughs) but I had acquired the domain name, baby John, J W N, which is a Philly slang word. If you're not familiar with, I had acquired babyjohn.com and sat on it for a couple of years and then finally realized like, oh, this would be a great place to host video interviews with doulas so people can get to know them so that I can't say like, oh, here's a list of six different doulas, but I could say here's uh, my website with interviews of a dozen different doulas who I think the world of. Check out my conversation with them. Um, And and when I, you know, when I find time between taking care of all the children (laughs) and all the things that that entails and recording an awesome podcast, (laughs) Um, I'm also expanding that to have video interviews with parents oh, wow. um, to talk about pregnancy, birth, and parenting experiences to kind of build an online village of storytellers sharing oh. their experiences with each other. What a great resource. Yeah. I can't believe something like that didn't already exist. It sounds like, you know, you are providing such, like, it's like a one-stop shop that you're building yeah. for you know, from the very beginning until after giving birth to just be supported all along the way. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and bring your babies if you're in the, oh my goodness. I mean, we can't, obviously, um, I'm sure by the time this airs and definitely while we're recording, we're all still living in a, um, we're currently in a shelter in place in Philadelphia. So we're not doing any in-person hangouts, but I do. One of the cool ways that I get to see people long after their babies are born is that I do a baby sign language play group and a toddler sign language play group in the Fishtown neighborhood of Philadelphia. So people can um, come hang out, learn some helpful signs so that they can communicate with their babies. And I, I mean, yeah, maybe your kid's going to be smart and a better communicator, but it's just fun. We've had a blast <laughs> doing sign language with our kids. And so, um, yeah, so from like, I just found out I was pregnant all the way through, um, this two year old needs to like go be around some other kids and I need to have a cup of coffee and see another adult and let's learn some signs. Um, I've got something pretty much all the way along the way to have a way to engage and offer something to, to families. That is awesome. That is so cool. So you've talked a lot about the ways that you give of yourself. You give a lot of your time and your energy Mm -hmm. for other people, for your family, for other families in the Philadelphia area. You are supporting other doulas. You are an amazing friend. I mean, you are just a giver. And yeah, I'm grateful to have you in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, But how do you kind of turn that all off? I'm sure there's times where you just need to have some Elizabeth time. What does Elizabeth time look like for you? Yeah, um, I'm really good at like, it it might seem like I'm like spinning my wheels and doing stuff all the time. Um, As much as I'm a um, good starter, because I get it really enthusiastic about things. I'm also really, um, I'm really a good quitter, <laughs> which, you know, you could say like quitter is a bad way. I don't think that it's bad to quit things when time is up. Yeah. And so I'm learning to discern when to end things well. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think this is where our podcast is going is that beginnings and endings and the way that they flow into each other when they're timed well. And when they're well supported, it's just like a really healthy way to life, a mm-hmm. breath in, a breath out. And so I'm good at quitting when I need to quit. And I'm getting better at saying like, nope, I need to let somebody else do this thing. Um, I'm good at sitting on my couch. 
I'm good at, um, I'm not as good as my dear friend Rachel at watching <laughs> junk reality TV, although I am pretty devoted to Married at First Sight. Um, I have seen all of the episodes of Arrested Development a dozen times each. Um, I'm happy to just be with my family and cook a good meal mm-hmm. and sit around and get snuggles for my kids. <laughs> um, the hormone that is, I would say, most important or that we talk about the most in birth and in pregnancy is the hormone oxytocin. Mm-hmm. And oxytocin is released from skin to skin. And so there's a lot of great value to babies going skin to skin mm-hmm. just after they're born. Um, but my kids love that snuggle time. So just to get to feel um, at ease and at rest in my own home with my kids is great. And so, yeah, and all of my, like, the people that know my family the best and are a part of sort of that replenishing joyous part of life are the ones that are like, yeah, if I want to see Elizabeth, I basically have to go park myself on the couch across from her. And so um, spending time, you know, having having a place where people feel welcome to come to. Mm. And where um, there's always coffee ready to be brewed and there's always like wild kids running around in such a way that like, you know, that you can bring whoever you are (laughs) Um, where, you know, again, children might be arguing about who has a penis and who has a vulva. It's just where it's just a warm, welcoming place. And so that sense of home and just what I get from being in my home. Um, And I do wander from my home. I'm not an entire homebody, but um, Philadelphia is also Mm -hmm. like just a sense of home um when I first came here I was only coming for a summer I was it was a summer internship with the uh organization that I ended up working for for about a decade I was like my third or fourth day here and it was just I had this terrifying exhilarating thought cross my mind of I think I could live here Hmm. and sure enough I did like I couldn't I used every break I had from college I was halfway through college every time I had a break I would find a way to get to Philly Mm. and so that's a sense of home I feel of just um you know total strangers I is that I mean do you feel that too like you feel a sense of belongingness even to total strangers um just from the way that it's a city of neighborhoods it's a it's a city where um I, I could I could go on. I was going to say it's a city where if you don't like us, we don't care. It's a city <laughs> of non pretension. Um, it's a city of um, yeah. It's just a great place to call home. I love where I grew. I grew up in Ohio, um, but I love I love that I grew up there. But I love that this is my home now. So anything Philly that I get to do, um, going to Smith Playground with my kids and taking a ride on a burlap sack down the wooden slide, um, getting to grab water ice is a treat hanging out at the um the hammocks at spruce street harbor park um going for a run on kelly drive like if it's philly i love it and it replenishes my soul to be here i love that about you because i think that we share that yeah um and the ways that we experience philly might be different I'm not hanging out at Smith Playground a whole yeah. lot. We'll um, take you. I've you been. Come with us. I have been. It is a great place. Um, but yeah, just that love of and and now the word gritty yeah. is synonymous with our uh, dear mascot for the Philadelphia Flyers. But it it is because Philly yeah. is such a gritty place, and I think that's part of why we both love it so much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am really excited to make this podcast with you to get to know you better through this podcast because I just learned so much just in the short amount that amount of time that we've talked today. Um, but we got to save some for later. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Now it's our turn to hear from you. So would you do us a big favor and go into your podcast app and rate us? Even better, would you write us a glowing review? That will help other listeners to find us. And make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss a single episode. You can also visit our website at everydaythinplaces.com, where you will find all sorts of fun and interesting information, as well as learn about how you can help to support this podcast and earn special exclusive perks. There you will also find links to follow us on social media, or else just pop directly over to Instagram or Facebook, where you will find us at everydaythinplaces. Thanks so much for joining us today. I 
Until next time, I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Rachel. Bye. Bye.